Well, welcome into this week's Degrees of Science. You know, we talk about severe thunderstorms and tornado winds, damaging winds and flooding concerns, but hail is something that can do a lot of damage as well. And we're talking to Christina Gropp, who is uh, works with the Insurance Institute of Business and Home Safety, and y'all study hail. Now, uh, Christina, why is it so important to learn more and research about hail? That's right. Hail is one of the four perils that we study here at IBHS. We study wind, wind-driven rain, hail, and wildfire. But hail in particular is a really big loss driver when it comes to severe weather. In fact, in any given year, more than 60 to 80 percent of the damage that we see from severe weather is actually caused by hail. Most people tend to think it's from tornadoes, but it's not. It's hailstones. We see so many hail events that damage property outside, and it really drives up laws. So IBHS spends a lot of time researching hail. We do that research both out in the field across the country and in our laboratory here in Fridgeburg, South Carolina. So when you talk about the damage and how immense it can be, what, what kind of damage do you all see when it comes to some of these big hail events that roll through? Sure. Well, starting with about half inch hail, that's when we can start seeing damage to crops and vegetation outside. So it doesn't have to be very big to start seeing some of that damage. Now, when we get up to about an inch and a half sized hail, that's when we start to see more damage to cars. And inch and a half up to about two inch hail is when we start to see damage to our roofs. And that's a big focus for us at IVHS is the impact of hail on roofs. When hail hits a roof, it can dent shingles, it can tear shingles, and it can displace those protective granules that are on your shingles as well. So those are the three ways that hail damages that roof. Once we see hail even larger than that, you get up to the gi giant stones and the gargantuan hailstones. Those can even come through your roof deck and into your house if uh, you're not careful with, with some of those bigger stones. Once we add in the wind, wind driven hail is yet another way that hail can damage our homes and businesses. We can see damage to siding. We can see damage to air conditioning units outside, windows, just about anything that's outside could be damaged by hail, especially wind driven hail. So you, you were talking about the the massive hail uh, tell me about y'all's group that y'all send out to study these potential record setting hailstones that we see sometimes yeah our hail quick response team is a couple of us here from the field research team and we go out very quickly after severe weather events when we may have a record setting hailstone on our hands and that group uh, brought me and one of my colleagues down to Salado, Texas back uh, last April after a hailstorm came through because we saw a picture on social media of a hailstone that was just so big. I've actually got a print of it right here with me. We flew down the day after the storm hit to a homeowner in Salado who had found the stone and she put it in her freezer because she thought it was interesting. And she happened to tweet about it. We saw her tweet and we reached out to her with the help of the local National Weather Service office down there in Dallas. And we connected with her to go down and measure the hailstone. She invited us into her home so that we could document it. And many people ask, well, why fly halfway across the country from your lab in South Carolina to scan a hailstone? And it's such important data for us and for the research engineers here at IBHS to have these really good measurements of hailstones. We don't see a lot of hailstones that are quite this big. This stone here from Salado, 5.67 inches in diameter. But getting a precise measurement on something this large and this uniquely shaped is challenging. And that's what 3D scanning really helps us with is getting those accurate measurements and it allows us to capture the volume of hailstones. Once we have these 3D prints, it enables us to study more about the aerodynamics of hailstones because we can replicate their exact geometry. And without 3D scanning them, they melt or sublime away. 
and we lose some of that time to study them. So 3D printing has really opened up more doors for us in the research side of hail to better understand hail so we can better forecast it and better understand how it impacts us. We've done a couple of these different deployments. Now, Salado wasn't quite the state record. The state record remains the Hondo, Texas hailstone that we 3D scanned the year before, back in 2021. It fell um, in Hondo. So you're showing those two, and I guess the first thing it's crazy is how wild is it that in back-to-back -back years we've had this kind of massive hail across the state of Texas? Unfortunately, you guys keep seeing hail of this size that, that brings our team to your area, and it, it really impacts homeowners, and that's why we do so much of this research, so hopefully we can reduce that impact. But we know there are more records out there. It's just a matter of have people found the stones, and not everyone thinks to, to save them and put them in the freezer, but we're grateful for the homeowners that have and who have allowed us to come out to their homes to scan these stones so that we can keep studying hail, keep better understanding it, and, and work towards reducing that impact on our lives. So you, you're talking about learning from those. What kind of have, what have y'all learned from looking at those hailstones and comparing it to the radar data and what the radar is predicting the potential of hail, how that correlation is between what you're finding and what you're seeing on the radar? Yeah, so radar is pretty good at detecting hail, especially now that we have dual polarization radar. That has led to a lot fewer false alarms. But what we have seen is that radar generally overestimates the size of hail, especially sub-severe hail. Once you get up to these larger stones, like the one that fell in Salado or in Hondo, that's when radar starts to even underestimate the maximum size of hail. So it really varies based on the size of the hill that ends up falling. And we also see that, that radar struggles with the geographic extent of a hail swap. The other component of our field program, beyond just the 3D scanning of the records, is we go out in the field throughout the spring and we deploy instruments in front of hailstorms that can safely measure the impacts of hailstones as a hailstorm passes over our array of instruments. Then we go back afterwards and we collect our instruments, we measure the stones that are on the ground, we 3D scan some of those as well, and then we can compare it to the radar data. So we can really get that ground truth of where the hail actually fell and how big it was compared to what the radar says fell. And that's where we've been able to make these connections between our ground truth data and what the radar says. There are very few research projects that are dedicated to hail. In fact, we're the only one in the US right now that's dedicated to studying hail. There is a project up in Canada now that's also studying hail specifically, but it's not a peril that a lot of folks focus on. Most of your field campaigns are focused on tornadoes and, and other uh, hazards that come with severe weather. So this data that we collect is pretty unique. So with all the research you've done and being out in the field, have y'all found any specific types of environments when it comes to storm that may be more conducive to these big amounts of hail or those big monster hailstones as well? Yeah, that's, that's one of the big goals of our project is understanding the environmental conditions that, that govern hail production. And it's something that we continue to look at. Our, our field program continues, but one of the things we've started to look at is that it, it's more than just shear and buoyancy. We look at things like updraft widths. And, and when we're talking about shear in particular, we're starting to see that the more east-west shear that we have in storms really helps hailstones stay in that hail growth zone a little bit longer and reach some of these larger sizes. So you're, you've been out in the field and doing a lot of stuff, but you also have a, a lab that y'all do work there. What, what kind of research and work are y'all doing in the lab to continue to learn about hailstones as well? So all of our field work informs what we do back here in the laboratory. When we started our lab here and built this facility back in 2010, we wanted to replicate hail in the lab, but there wasn't enough data. 
That's part of why we started the field program was to collect that fundamental data on the properties of natural hailstones. And now that we have the largest research grade data set of hailstone measurements, we're able to realistically recreate in the lab, lab manufactured hailstones. And that allows us to do testing against like roofing products in particular. That's a big focus of ours here at IBHS is how hail impacts roofs. So we take the data from the field we manufacture hailstones here in the laboratory and then we test them against roofing products so we can take a look at what impact resistant shingles actually live up to their label as being impact resistant. So you're, you're talking about making artificial ones is, you know, for anyone that's been out with hail, it can be all different kind of sh shapes and sizes and odd looking shapes like that. Do y'all take that into account when y'all make the artificial hail so this, see how that impacts stuff? We tend to keep all of our hailstones right now as spheres in the laboratory. We're starting to explore some more of those unique shapes, but all of the other properties of hail, including its hardness, which is a, a unique one, we keep that mimicking what it, we see out in the field. So hailstones are a lot different than the ice that comes out of your freezer. They're less dense than that. And we mimic those properties back here in the laboratory. So what we are testing roofing products against is just like what falls and hits your roof. Well, Christine, I, I'm, I really appreciate you taking time to talk with us. It's, it's amazing, again, just how we always group to just snap of a finger, jump on a plane, come from South Carolina to Texas to study something like this. But it's interesting the work you are doing, and I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down and talk with me. Thank you so much. And if you want to check out our roof shingle hail impact ratings that show you how well some of those impact resistant products really do stand up to hailstones, they're on our website. They're at ibhs.org slash impact ratings. And you can use that chart if you're replacing your roof and getting new shingles to make sure that your investment in impact resistant shingles is worth it.